Good evening. I want to uh, welcome you to the second installment of the 2012 Fall Lecture Series of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. My name is Tim Swindle. I'm the head of the Department of Planetary Sciences and director of the Lunar and Planetary Lab. And uh, we have these lectures once uh, a month during the fall. There are also lectures uh, once every other week over at Stewart Observatory. Theirs are on Monday nights. Ours are on Wednesday nights. The uh, last one, uh, a couple of plugs before we get started tonight, uh, the last one in our series is Wednesday, November 14th, uh, Weather and Climate on Planets Orbiting Other Stars, A New Frontier in Planetary Science by uh, Dr. Adam, Sh Adam Shulman, one of our faculty members. Uh, a couple of other things I want to mention, there is an exhibit in the building next door, Flandreau Planetarium, called Great Balls of Fire, presented by the OSIRIS-REx Asteroid Sample Return Mission, which the sample return, uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission is also a part of the Lunar and Planetary Lab. And it's an exhibit about asteroids, comets, and impacts, the small bodies of the solar system. Um, there are flyers for it out on the table outside. Um, there's also flyers about the lecture series, but there's flyers for the um, Great Balls of Fire exhibit. I encourage you to take a walk through it. If you are um, a teacher, have a school group, on the back side is information on how to uh, get reduced admission or something like that. And finally, I want to mention that we do have a mailing list. If you are interested in news of what's going on in the lab, um, you know, get notifications ab uh, about events like this or the Great Balls of Fire, that sort of thing, there is a sign up for that outside as well. And this evening, our speaker is going to be Dr. Tom Zega, who is an assistant professor in the Lunar and Planetary Lab. He's been here about 18 months, something like that. Um, Tom's background, he's got a bachelor's degree from Rutgers in New Jersey, has a PhD from a, a university in uh, some small town, I think, called Tempe. Um, he came to us from the Naval Research Laboratory in, uh, we, we hired him in spite of that. <laughs> he came to us from the Naval Research Laboratory in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, he studies, he uses really big machines to study really small particles from amazing places like the interiors of stars, which is what he's going to be telling us about tonight. Um, when he's not at work, you know, you might bump into him in Altour, but please don't bump into him because we want to keep him around for a while. So without further ado, Tom Zega. Okay, thanks, Tim, for the uh, introduction. Can you all hear me, by the way? Okay. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm pleased to have been asked to give the, uh, one of the um, evening lectures uh, for, for this semester. Uh, and so as Tim mentioned, I, I look, at, look at small things with big machines, and I'll, I'll get into talking about that. Uh, but I thought I'd introduce the topic to you first. And by way of introduction, I thought maybe it's best to sort of show a, a quick video uh, and what I would like you to sort of listen for are keywords, uh, specifically debris, disk, and dust, and gas, okay? So this is sort of a nice little video. And basically what you're going to see is a visualization of the Orion Nebula. And you can sort of imagine yourself being in a spaceship and traveling through a nebula and examining the, the properties uh, within a, a, a cloud of gas and dust. And I'm going to come back to this theme uh, at several points during my talk, and that's why I'd like you to sort of keep keep your ears open for it. So let's just uh, see if this plays, and it, I think it will. And there's somebody who's going to narrate it. Using volume visualization, we can investigate the three-dimensional structure of the Orion Nebula. This nebula is an enormous cloud of dust and gas that is several light years across and 1,500 light years from Earth. Gas in the cloud glows from the light of four hot young stars at the heart of the nebula. Each star is thousands of times brighter than our sun. The center of the nebula is hollowed out by radiation from these central stars. We're passing a cloud called HST-10, known to astronomers from Hubble Space Telescope images. 
A disk of dust and debris orbits the star. Astronomers believe this marks the birth of a system of planets. Each of these teardrop-shaped clouds is a blanket of gas and dust that surrounds a newborn star. Okay, I think that's where I'll end the visualization, but did you pick up on the keywords gas, dust, disk, so on and so forth? Okay, so these are, these are important things to keep in mind as we're talking about the formation of our own solar system and why it's important to, uh, to study uh, materials at the levels of scale that I'll, that I'll talk about, okay? So, as I said, I'm going to talk about doing laboratory-based astronomy. And so astronomers study stars, right? So why don't we talk about star birth for, for just a minute again and reconsider. So aside from our own sun, which we know is about, what, 93 million miles away from us, right? It's one astronomical unit. So that's the closest star to us. But aside from our sun, the nearest star is about 4.4 light years away. But despite these vast distances, the, the space in between is not empty. It's actually filled with material, thinly filled, if you will, but, uh, but nonetheless filled with gas and dust. And that makes up the interstellar medium or the ISM. Okay, and this is a nice picture of what the interstellar medium might look like, where you see gas. Uh, and some of this gas is denser in other regions uh, that you can tell by the picture here. And there's dust in here as well. But the point is that there's actually material between, uh, between stars that fills up space and makes up the interstellar medium. Now, when that gas gets, gets uh, dense enough, if it can accumulate under its own gravitation, it will form something called a molecular cloud. And you saw an example of that in the video just a moment ago. Okay? But perhaps among the most famous of molecular clouds is this one here in this particular image. This is a Hubble Space, to Space Telescope image taken by Jeff Hester and Paul Scowen. This was back in 1995. This is of the Eagle Nebula. And it's uh, believed to be a stellar nursery. This particular image is called the Pillars of Creation, uh, probably because you can tell it's got these large actually these giant pillars. Actually, giant's not even really a, a good way to describe it because these pillars are about nine and a half light years high or about 90 trillion kilometers, okay? But it's in these kinds of clouds, these, these pockets of dense gas and dust, particularly the most opaque regions of these clouds where we think that they're probably dense enough to ignite stars and get them to start, uh, get them to start forming, okay? So the center of these clouds, if they're dense enough, they'll contract. Uh, they'll, they'll form a protostar because they'll convert gravitational to thermo, thermal energy. And you can ignite nuclear fusion this way in the core of the star. And the cloud will collapse. It'll shed its angular momentum by ejecting material as these ionized jets of, of gas and dust. And it pumps energy back into the cloud and it aids in the clearing of the dust, okay? And a, and a disk of dust and gas can end up for, for, uh, forming around the star itself. And this is a series of images taken over uh, five years here of a uh, disk uh, called HH30. And you can see these jets are coming off here. And at the center of uh, uh, the, uh, the st just around the center of the star here is a disk of gas and dust, okay? So gas and dust are very important because over time, this material can get sorted in such a way that material can end up accreting to form planets. Particles stick together, right? They make bigger particles, they make boulders. Eventually these things make planets. But accretion turns out that it's not 100% efficient. And material can be left over in the form of uh, asteroids, comets, meteors, and dust. So this is sort of a uh, graphical representation of this whole process. We start out with a molecular cloud. We condense it, gravitationally collapse and condense it, and we make a star, a protostar. We've got a cloud of gas and dust around that star. The gas and dust gets sorted out. Eventually, we form things like uh, asteroids, planets, uh, and everything that doesn't go into forming the, the planets can be left over, right? And these are the samples of asteroids, comets, meteorites, and dust that we can get here on Earth. They fall from the sky. We can get samples of these things, we can bring them to the laboratory, and we can study them in detail for their chemical makeup, their structural makeup. And we know from studying things like meteorites that our solar system probably formed close to or, or near to uh, massive stars, okay? Uh, 
So what are meteorites? Well, I said they fall from the sky, but really meteorites are rocks. They're rocks from space. Uh, and they've also been called shooting stars. And I thought it'd be uh, interesting to just show an example of a, a meteorite falling. This is a particular meteorite called the Peekskill meteorite. And it was fortuitous that it fell on October 9th, uh, 1992. This was a Friday evening. And lots of people happened to be at football games that, that evening. And so they were armed uh, with cameras and whatnot. And they actually ended up recording uh, a particular meteorite fall. So you can see this object here is coming through the sky. Uh, these folks have no idea what's going on behind them, I guess, except the person shooting, uh, shooting the image here. So this was over, um, this was over Cleveland, o Cleveland, Ohio. But the meteorite was making its way across the eastern seaboard. And folks in Pennsylvania, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, actually picked it up while they were attending uh, a football game. So here it is again. Here's the football players. They don't know what's going on because they're playing the football game, right? But here it is. It's sort of coming through the sky here. It's breaking up. Uh, it's very, very hot, which is why it's bright, because it's frictionally heated by the atmosphere. But eventually it, it cools off and, and it'll land and it's samples of this that we can actually collect on Earth, okay? And we can look at these things in the laboratory. So eventually it fell in Peekskill, New York. It hit this poor lady's car. Um, despite it destroying at least part of her car, she doesn't look all that uh, unhappy about it. She's, she's, still, <laughs> she's still smiling, I guess. Um, but, uh, but it landed in 1992, and obviously one can go and, you know, if it lands, you can pick up a sample and you can bring this in the laboratory, okay? And now you have basically this fossil relic uh, from, from, this, from space, okay? So meteorites are really important because they they contain material that form both inside of our solar system and outside of our solar system. I just showed you a video a moment ago. And I went through star formation, if you will, and explained that uh, we in part think that the solar system came from a precursor molecular cloud, okay? So meteorites, if they're primitive and pristine enough, that is, they haven't been altered significantly either on Earth or out in space, they are relics. They've trapped material from the solar system, both uh, material formed inside of it and outside of it uh, before our solar system actually was put together. Parts of the molecular cloud and actually parts of stars, actually ancient stardust, literally pieces of stars, solid grains from stars. And we'll describe how that process works in, uh, in just a moment. Okay? So we call these things pre-solar stardust grains or just pre-solar grains. Why do we call them pre-solar? Because they form prior to our solar system. They condensed in the gaseous environments around ancient stars. They were ejected from those environments. They were transported through the interstellar medium. They were injected into uh, local parts of our galaxy, in our case, our solar system, over 4.6 billion years ago when our solar system was being put together. And everything, like I said, that didn't go into forming the sun or the planets was left over in the form of meteorites. These things fall on Earth, and we can collect them, and we can study them in the laboratory, okay? So these are from ancient stars, and I should make the point that these stars have long since died. They're no longer around, so we're actually looking at ashes of, of dead stars now, okay? And these are the building blocks in part of our own solar system. So you might ask then, if you can find these things in meteorites, where are they, right? So what does a meteorite look like? So this is what a meteorite might look like, a particular type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite. Looks like if you were to take it, so this is the bulk sample here, and it's got this nice sort of rounded surface to, the, to it, and this is called the fusion crust. This forms when the meteorite is coming through the atmosphere. It's being heated up, materials ablating off of it. If you were to cut this, this meteorite open and look at an exposed fresh face, this is what it might actually look like, okay? And so what you might see in this particular image are these these larger sort of grains here. And just for scale, we have a one centimeter uh, cube here. So these things are pretty small, right? You see these white particles here, some of, some of these over here. But really, the bulk of the sample, when you look at it, it's all this really fine grain black stuff, OK? And this stuff is intimately mixed at the nanometer scale, some of it, OK? And a lot of the, there's, a, there's carbon in here. There's silicate material. So these are minerals that contain silicon and oxygen in them, other metals like iron and magnesium.
but the pre-solar grains, the pre-solar stardust grains, don't exactly jump out at you, right? They don't say, hey, I'm right here. Come and find me. Come and get me. You have to actually go in and look for them. So this has often been likened to trying to find needles, pre-solar grains being the needles, in the haystack, and the haystack being the bulk of the meteorite. And so this sort of fine grain material here, you can think of it as being the sea of background material in which everything else occurs in the meteorite, and this is called the matrix, okay? So what we need to do is find these pre-solar stardust grains in the matrix. We have to find the needles in the haystack, okay? How do we do that? Okay, well, we do that by getting rid of the haystack is what we do, okay? So here's the bulk meteorite sample. Um, and the pre-solar grains are somewhere in this black material here, uh, which is mostly material that formed in the solar system. And we're trying to isolate these tiny, tiny dust grains from stars. And the way we do that, we've developed these recipes over the years of basically taking bulk samples like this and sticking them in chemistry beakers with really nasty acids, okay? Nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, one of the nastiest acids known to mankind, perchloric acid. And basically, the, what this does, in fact, it's really criminal, right? Because you have this fossil record from the solar system. And this is something that we can probe and study uh, for chemical and physical processes that happen in our own solar system. But because we're interested in these stardust grains, we have to get rid of all this stuff to find them, right? So we put them in these harsh acids, and we get rid of this bulk material because most of this is made of silicate material, which dissolves readily in these kinds of acids, okay? And then we produce a residue, uh, and whatever's left in this residue is really robust to acid treatment. And basically what you're doing here is statistically increasing your chances of finding these stardust grains, which occur in really low abundance in these meteorites. So you take a residue like this, uh, you put it in something called a, an electron microscope. You can scan it. You can look for fine dust grains. So this is one of the stardust grains that I'll talk about a little bit tonight here. And uh, just to note the scale bar here, so that white line there is about 100 nanometers, okay? What's a nanometer? Well, a nanometer is one with a bunch of zeros in front of it. It's really, really small. We'll talk about what that is in just a moment. You've probably heard of nanotechnology and whatnot. So nanometer comes comes into play. And this grain here is about, uh, I don't know, 200 or so nanometers in, in width or diameter. And so we need really high resolution analytical techniques to probe the chemistry of these materials, to probe the atomic structure of these materials. Why do we want that information? Because we want to know about the stars. We want to know what kinds of nucleosynthesis took place in the stars. We want to know the conditions under which these grains formed and the gaseous envelopes around these stars. And by knowing something about those conditions, we might be able to say something about where they formed uh, around these stars. And I'll show you an example of that in, uh, in a few minutes. But let's just sort of get back to this notion of scale here, right? We have this, this nanometer scale here. So what is the scale of small? So if an, one nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, so it's a one with eight zeros in front of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? That's really, really small. So that's, but it's not very intuitive when you think about it that way. So let's sort of put it graphically, right? People, we're about one meter tall, right? That's easy, easy to sort of uh, think about. Apples, about uh, 10 to the minus one meter. A wasp, 10 to the minus two or one centimeter. Ants, 10 to the minus three or one millimeter. Hair, 10 to the minus four or 100 microns now, okay? Cell, we all have cells in our body. Cells, 10 to the minus five meters, 10 microns. Bacteria, 10 to the minus six or one micron. Viruses, 10 to the minus seven. Now we're sort of in the nanometer realm here at 100 nanometers. DNA, 10 to the minus eight uh, meters or 10 nanometers. Going down to water molecules, 10 to the minus nine meters or one nanometer. And then if we go down to the scale of the atom, now we're about 10 to the minus 10, or what's called an angstrom, one angstrom. If we go even below that, the subatomic and electron orbitals, now we're about 10 to the minus 11 meters, or 0.1 angstrom. So when we're talking about these pre-solar grains, and we're saying they're nanometer scale, we're talking about a scale that's roughly in this range here, okay? So clearly we need techniques that are capable of analyzing these, these tiny particles at really, really high uh, spatial resolutions, if you will, okay? So the scale of small.
So how do we measure such grains? So one of the ways we measure these, uh, these grains is using something called a secondary ion mass spectrometer, or SIMS. Scientists like acronyms, so we use them all the time. So SIMS here stands for secondary ion mass spectrometer. And so what one does in an instrument like this is places a sample inside of a chamber. We accelerate a beam of ions at the sample. And what that does is it disrupts the material, it ionizes the material. We can send it into a mass spectrometer and we can analyze it for its isotopic composition. Okay? And we analyze it for its isotopic composition because that gives us information on nucleosynthesis that's occurring inside of the star. So let's just remind ourselves for a moment, what are isotopes? So we know, okay, that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? The nucleus contains protons and neutrons. That's what gives the atom its mass. Electrons orbit around the nucleus. And so isotopes of an element have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons, right? So these are really key. Isotopes are really key for identifying pre-solar grains because it's the isotopes that record the nucleosynthetic processes that are occurring inside of stars. And so there's a series of reactions here, and it's not really important what the details of these reactions are, other than to say that you can fuse light atoms together, like helium. So this is helium with a mass number of four. It fuses with another helium to make beryllium, eight. Okay, so we can fuse atoms together, and we can make heavier and heavier nuclei, if you will, heavier uh, uh, masses, if you will. And we can measure these isotopes inside of these solid dust grains using a technique like this. And by doing that, we learn about the nucleosynthetic processes, that is, these kinds of reactions that are occurring inside of these stars. Okay, so before I, get, I go on with the details of some of the measurements and tell you about the implications of some of the, the data, let's just talk about stellar evolution for, for a moment. So stars spend most of their life uh, fusing hydrogen into helium, and this happens inside of the core of the star, okay? Hydrogen is fusing together, it's making heavier nuclei like helium, and this is called the main sequence of the star's life. It's called the main sequence because of where it sits on this particular diagram here. This is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and it relates the solar luminos the luminosity of the star, how much light it's putting out, uh, relative to the temperature of the star. So hot, bright, and massive stars are up here in the diagram. Uh, cool, dim, and small stars are down here in the diagram. And our sun is just about here right in the center. Okay, so our sun right now is spending most of its life fusing uh, hydrogen together in the core, making helium. Okay, and that's the main sequence. But at some point, it's going to run out of fuel in the core. It's going to run out of hydrogen to fuse together. And when it runs out of nuclear fuel, what ends up happening is that the core starts to collapse. And the reason it collapses is because it can't generate or radiate enough pressure anymore uh, to keep the, the, the core itself from collapsing. So the core starts to collapse, and the envelope, the gaseous envelope around the core, starts to expand. And when that happens, the star will move off of the main sequence in this diagram, and it will become something called a red giant. Okay? And our sun is actually going to go through this in about 5 billion years from now. And when it does, it'll probably expand beyond the orbit of Earth. It'll swallow us up, and that'll be it. It's not optimistic, I know, but we're not going to be around uh, when that happens, OK? So, uh, so about 5 billion years, we'll go, we'll, we'll go into the red giant phase. But the key point is when this happens, when it enters this kind of phase, it starts ejecting its matter rapidly. And that matter will start traveling away from the center of the star. And when temperature and pressure conditions are just right, solid mineral dust will actually condense. Uh, and when it does so, it records the chemistry of the gas in which it condenses. It records uh, the, the bulk chemistry. It records the isotope chemistry. And that chemistry reflects the processes that were going on inside of the star when the grain actually formed. Okay. So if we can get samples of these solid dust grains and we can measure them in the laboratory, then guess what? We can learn about the processes that were going on during this time, okay? So let's, let's go back to our diagram here, okay? So that's the red giant branch phase. So as the envelope is expanding here and dust is condensing, the core is continuing to collapse. And as it's collapsing, it's, 
it's getting denser and denser, temperatures are getting higher, uh, it's getting very, very hot inside of the core, and it will reach a critical temperature at which helium can ignite, and we can start fus fusing helium nuclei together and making heavier elements. But eventually the helium will run out, and guess what? The core starts collapsing again, the envelope expands, we get dust starting to condense, uh, and we get enter what's called the asymptotic giant branch stage of stellar evolution. That is, the star moves up this part of the diagram, but it does so in something called the, in an asymptotic way. So if you've ever taken any math courses, maybe you've learned about asymptotes and whatnot. So the trajectory of, in which the star moves along this diagram is called the asymptotic trajectory. And so this is called the asymptotic giant branch phase of stellar evolution. And so the star will start shedding its matter again. It'll condense solid material. And if we can get samples of this and we can measure it for its chemistry, again, we can learn something about the evolution of the star. Okay, so what happens after this? After this phase, really any further evolution depends on the mass of the star. So stars that are under about 10 solar masses, eventually what will happen is they'll just cool off. They'll cool off, they'll die, they'll shed their matter, well, maybe they'll form a planetary nebula, uh, but they'll cool off and they'll eventually become white dwarfs. So this is sort of a to scale uh, graphic, if you will, of a white dwarf compared to the size of the Earth. So eventually our sun is going to do this. Uh, but if the star, on the other hand, is massive enough, if it's greater than about 10 times the size of our own sun, uh, eventually the core will continue to contract. And when it reaches a certain point, it can't contract anymore because the matter becomes something called degenerate. And it doesn't really matter what that actually means. But basically what will happen is a shock wave will start propagating through the bulk of the star. And it will explode in spectacular fashion and become a supernova. Okay? This is what we know as a supernova. And this is a picture, an actual, I think this is a, an HST image of a, of a supernova. I forget which one here. But the point is that the supernova will eject its matter into the interstellar medium, and as this is happening, more solid material can actually condense. And if we get grains of this material in the meteorites as well, we can study it and learn about processes that actually happen in supernovae. Okay? And just a side note here, the two, the, this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, of course this is named after the scientist who uh, developed it, and this was originally developed, it, developed in 1910, and you can sort of think of this as a uh, stellar handprint. It's still in use today. Uh, Henry Russell was a, an American astronomer, and uh, Enyar? Einar Hertzsprung uh, was a Danish chemist and astronomer, and he was actually the advisor of uh, Gerard Kuiper, after whom this building is actually named. So just sort of an aside story about the uh, HR diagram here. Okay, so that's stellar evolution. I said we can measure these isotopes of these grains uh, with these sophisticated analytical techniques. Let's get on to talk about what some of these grains actually look like. So we've found uh, at this point a number of different types of pre-solar stardust grains and meteorites. Among those are actually diamonds. So we find diamonds in meteorites. Uh, and this is what they look like. They're really small. They're nanometers in scale. And what you're looking at here, maybe some of you can make out these lines that are running across the image here. That's actually the atomic planes of the diamond. And we look at that using sophisticated techniques called transmission electron microscopy. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the point is that things like diamond, right? This is uh, carbon formed at high pressures. Diamond occurs in the meteorites as pre-solar grains. Uh, silicates uh, are also abundant pre-solar grain types in, in meteorites, different types of silicates. So here's an example here of a silicate called olivine. It's MgSiO4 in proportions of uh, two magnesium to four oxygen and one silicon. So this is olivine. And this particular grain formed in a supernova. There's grains of uh, silicon carbide. So one to one silicon to carbon. These occur in the meteorites as well. And these probably form in the asymptotic giant branch stars, AGB stars. We find oxides like spinel. MgAl204, and I'll tell you a story about spinel grains that I study tonight. Uh, we also find graphite, right? Where's, where do you find graphite? Anyone? Yeah, in your pencil. You find graphite in your pencil. Turns out graphite actually forms in the gaseous environments around carbon-rich stars, okay? Uh, 
So pre-solar graphite, believe it or not. Aluminum oxide, Al203, we find that in uh, uh, meteorites as pre-solar grains. We also find some other rare materials like a mineral called hibonite, calcium aluminate, CaAl12019. And this is a picture of, of hibonite. And there are others, but the most abundant ones are the diamonds, the silicates, some of the carbides, graphite, silicon carbide, oxides like spinel and, and corundum. And I'll talk about uh, spinel tonight in a, in a little bit of detail. Okay, so here's, here's spinel, MgAl204. And these are actually uh, images of what the spinel grains look like. This is after you get them out of the meteorite, right? You've taken this bulk sample, you've subjected it to these nasty acids, and you've actually measured it now for its isotopic composition, right? This, I said a moment ago, was the key to identifying these, these small dust grains inside of the meteorites, was to I identify their isotopic composition. So we have to measure them using these techniques like secondary ion mass spectrometry, and this is what they look like after they come out of the secondary ion mass spectrometer. So typically what we do is we get this residue, we disperse it onto a gold foil, so AU stands for gold. And the reason we use gold is because it's conductive and we're, when we're accelerating ions at the sample to measure it, uh, the gold uh, will will dissipate the charge buildup, and charge buildup interferes with the measurement. So that's why we use gold. And it turns out that the ion beam that we use to measure these grains sputters gold. It ionizes the gold and sputters it away quickly and easily, whereas the grains don't sputter away quickly and easily. So what you end up seeing after you measure these things is a grain basically sitting on top of a pedestal, if you will. So I don't know if you can make that out here, but you can probably see it here. Here's the grain, and then you can see this sort of material right underneath here. That's sort of the pedestal on which the grain is sitting uh, in relief above, if you will, in relief from the gold substrate on which the grain was originally sitting, okay? So that's why these grains look like this when we get them inside of the microscope and look at them. And you can see that they have different shapes and, and what we call morphology to them. Some have these small particles here. Others look like they have sort of oblong shapes here. Uh, this particular grain looks kind of rounded, uh, but this is primarily formed as a result of measuring the isotopic composition of, of these materials. They didn't necessarily look this way when they formed around these uh, ancient stars, okay? And then I have some scale bars here for reference. So this one here is about two microns, okay, wide. So this grain here is probably a couple microns wide. Uh, this grain here is about a micron. This grain here is probably a several hundred nanometers in diameter. And then this one here is probably about uh, a micron or so. And a micron is about a thousand nanometers, just to kind of keep us uh, in scale here. And then these four grains were identified in four different meteorites, okay? So this grain here was identified from a residue of the Orgay uh, meteorite. Anybody know where meteorites, how meteorites get their names? Want to take a guess? No? Yeah, sure. Isn't this the order that they're discovered and every year? In some cases, yeah. It turns out in some cases that's for Antarctic meteorites, and I'll say something about that in just a moment. But these meteorites here don't get their names that way. They get their names by where they fell on Earth, okay? So this particular meteorite fell in Orgay, France in 1864. This particular meteorite here, the Murray meteorite, fell in 1950 in Kentucky. And then these two here, which the young man was just commenting on, uh, these get their names in part by the order in which they were found. So these are uh, meteorites that were found in Antarctica, okay? So I don't know if you know, but the National Science Foundation sponsors a program called ANSMET, the Antarctic Search uh, for Meteorites. And every year, people go down to Antarctica and they look for, for meteorites there. Any guesses as to why one would want to look in Antarctica for meteorites? Yeah, back row. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? What business does a rock have doing on an ice sheet, right? They're easy to spot. And it turns out that uh, many, many thousands, thousands of meteorites have been found in Antarctica. And you can apply to the program. Generally, only scientists go, but anybody, I think, can apply to the program. Uh, our department head, Professor Swindle here, has been there. Four times, okay? So he's kind of an Antarctica junkie, if you will. Loves going to Antarctica. And if you want, you can talk to 
to Professor Swindle about this. He's got all kinds of great stories about uh, finding meteorites in Antarctica. I haven't actually been there yet. I think one day I'll go, but I have young children right now, so it's, uh, it's difficult to, to, to find time. You actually go during the uh, Antarctic field season, which is summer, winter for us, but summer, summer for them, right? So it's between what, Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving and end of, end of January is when, when you go to Antarctica to look for the meteorites. Um, but it's really, a, it looks like a fascinating place to spend, uh, spend the holidays. And you get to uh, hunt around on a, on a snowmobile and, and, and look for meteorites. And uh, again, you can talk to Professor Swindle about this. It's, it's, uh, it's, he's been there a bunch of times and has great stories about it. Anyway, the point is that these particular grains here were identified in meteorites that were found in Antarctica, okay? So, uh, so these were identified in these residues from these Antarctic meteorites. Okay, so now that we found these, these actual grains here, we want to actually probe them for particular properties, and among those properties are the isotopic chemistry, if you will. We said a moment ago, uh, we reminded ourselves what isotopes actually are here, and among the isotopes that we actually look for in these grains, particularly these oxide grains here, right? We're looking at a spinel, MgAl204. Spinel is the mineral name. This is the chemical formula. Obviously, it's got oxygen in it. So we can measure isotopes of the elements that this particular mineral contains. And it contains lots of oxygen. So it turns out that oxygen has three isotopes, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. And it's the primary way Measuring oxygen isotopes is the primary way by which we identify these pre-solar stardust oxide grains, okay? So what you're looking at here, I know it looks very complicated, but actually it's rather simple. You're looking at a plot that shows the ratio of oxygen 17 isotope, ratio to oxygen 16, relative to oxygen 18, uh, ratio to oxygen 16. And you can sort of think of this as like a stellar roadmap for the grain isotope chemistry. So depending on where these grains actually fall in this particular diagram, it tells us something about the star in which the grain condensed, okay? So every one of these red dots here is where each of these grains that we measured for their oxygen isotope composition plots on this diagram. So for example, this particular grain plots right here. And knowing where it plots, and by comparing that to nucleosynthetic models of how stars evolve, we can say, well, this grain here probably formed in a star that was experiencing the red giant branch stage of stellar evolution. It came from a star that was about 1.2 times the, the mass of our own sun. And it had, the star had a bulk composition that was roughly what the sun's composition is, okay? We can do that for all these different grains for the most part. So this grain here, it plots right here, one of our Antarctic grains identified in the Antarctic meteorite. So this is our grain here. It formed in a star that was evolving along somewhere between the red giant and the asymptotic giant branch stage of stellar evolution. And a star that was about 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And it had about 80% of the chemistry of our sun. And astronomers refer to chemistry of stars in terms called metallicity. Anybody know what metallicity is? Any guesses what metallicity is? Yes. Yes, but what, what, particularly what kind of metals? Yes, but, there, but I'm getting at specific, what's that? No, no, it's, it's, maybe it's an unfair question, but it's, astronomers consider metallicity as all elements heavier than helium. So everything in a periodic table that's heavier than helium. Now, if you're, if you're a chemist or a physicist or a geologist, has a very specific meaning. It's not all elements heavier than helium. It's things like iron and magnesium, uh, iron and uh, nickel and manganese and cobalt and so on and so forth, right? It's not things like what, like lithium and boron and oxygen, so on and so forth. But that aside, we can use these uh, isotopic uh, uh, analyses to basically gauge the chemistry or the bulk composition of the star, okay? And we can do that for each of these grains here. And I don't want to dwell on the details of all these grains, but basically it tells us something about the history of the star from which the grain condensed. And we can measure uh, other isotopes too. We can measure things like magnesium and aluminum, and we could talk about the mixing processes that are going on inside of these stars, 
We can talk about uh, supernovae if the grain came from a supernova. We can talk about mixing processes inside of those stars. And for many years, this is where pre green research or stardust research basically stopped because we were only able to probe the chemistry or the isotope composition of these grains. Okay? But in recent years, uh, because of new enabling technologies, we've been able to take this a step further. Okay? And this is really what I do. I use uh, these large instruments like Professor Swindle uh, alluded to when he introduced me, uh, such as transmission electron microscopy. Okay? And this is a method, it's a microscopic method where we use electrons uh, to probe the atomic structure of these materials. Okay? So this is what a particular microscope looks like. This is the lab I used to work in in Washington, D.C. And basically what happens is you put a sample right in here. This is the sample chamber door. And there's a gun at the top, literally an electron gun. It accelerates electrons at really, really high energies, uh, nearly 80% the speed of light, uh, into the sample. And the sample has to be really thin, under 100 nanometers in total thickness. And the reason for that is because we have to get proper scattering in the sample in order to probe the atomic structure of the material. And, uh, and in so doing, we can probe the atomic structure and we can also probe the chemistry of the material. So not isotope composition now. I'm talking about the actual mineral composition. So I said that spinel has these elemental proportions, right? One magnesium to two aluminum, one magnesium to four oxygen. We can't learn this from measuring isotopes but we can learn it from probing the chemical makeup in instruments like this, okay? So how does this actually work and what do data actually look like uh, when we uh, take pictures of these materials at really high spatial scales? So here's an example of a sample that I studied some years ago. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what you see in this particular image are a bunch of white dots, right? But they're all arranged in a very periodic fashion. And what you're really looking at here is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional crystalline solid. Okay? This is a three-dimensional structure. And what you're looking at are columns of atoms. So if you could sort of imagine that we have a three-dimensional object here and atoms are coming in and out of the screen that you're looking at, what you're forming in this kind of microscopic image is a projection of columns of atoms. So each one of these white dots here are actually columns of atoms. So these turn out to be iron atoms. Here's an iron atom, iron atom, iron atom. This is a gallium atom. This is an arsenic atom, gallium arsenic, so on and so forth. So using these kinds of techniques, we can probe at very, very high spatial scales what the atomic structure actually looks like and form direct images of atoms. Okay? But we don't always have to form direct images of atoms to determine what the structure of the material is. We can also form things called diffraction patterns. Okay? And so you can sort of envision this as like shining light on the crystal itself, where this is the crystal, it's sort of a cartoon ball and stick model of what the crystal actually looks like. And this is what we end up seeing inside of the electron microscope. And the, the orientation of the spots here, their geometry, the distances between them have specific relationships to the distances in the structure. And if we tilt the crystal around, we can actually watch these patterns change uh, as this happens, okay? So you're sort of seeing the pattern change as this crystal rotates. And now you can sort of appreciate as this thing rotates that it is, in fact, a three-dimensional object here. And I'll just animate it again so you can see that. So now you can sort of see now that we have an actual three-dimensional crystal here. And we can measure the structure of the material using these spot patterns or these diffraction patterns, okay? So now that you can measure these kinds of things, you might ask, well, why do we want to know that about these pre-solar stardust grains? And the reason that we want to know that is because they have particular structures that are directly related to the pressure and temperature conditions in which they form inside of these gaseous envelopes. So knowing something about structure tells us about pressure and temperature. Okay? It's also important to know chemistry, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But in order to get them inside of in order to get these small stardust grains inside of an instrument like this, I said a moment ago that we have to make them very, very thin so that we get efficient scattering inside of the sample to look at these kinds of levels of scale. And that's where this particular uh, instrument comes into play. It's called a focused ion beam, FIB, 
scanning electron microscope, SEM, fib -SEM. And basically what it does is it combines an electron beam with an ion beam, uh, which allows us to make really site-specific samples in anything that we want to look at. And this particular instrument was really developed by the semiconductor industry. Companies like Intel, they're interested in looking at really small areas of their, of their microprocessors because they want to investigate how devices fail. But it wasn't long before physicists and chemists, geologists, cosmochemists, astrophysicists recognized the power of using this kind of technique to investigate things like stardust grains and meteorites, uh, which is uh, what basically I do and use it for is to make these small samples. So how does this work? Okay. So here's one of our stardust grains. This is our spinel, MgAl204. It's sitting on its pedestal here that we talked about a moment ago. Here's the gold substrate around it. We want to get this thin sample, right? We want to make this thin sample, get it out of the, out of the, uh, out of the substrate, and analyze it inside of our transmission electron microscope. So usually the first thing we do is we put a, a, a protective cap uh, over it. This is called a strap in fib parlance, if you will. And then we do, and we do that because we want to protect it against the ion damage when we're accelerating ions at it and sputtering away material, uh, which we need to make these thin samples. So we put this cap on it, and now we have to get rid of the material on both sides of it. And that's what you see in this image here. So here's our gold substrate, gold substrate. Here's our carbon cap, our carbon cap. Our grain is sitting just beneath this hump here. And now we've removed all this material on either side. And just for scale here, this scale bar here is about, I think that says 10 microns, if I'm not mistaken. Okay? So this is really small, 10 microns wide. And we're making this thin coupon, if you will. Some people call these things coupons, right? And then what we do is we come in with a really small needle, and we weld it to this coupon. We lift it out, and then we attach it to something called a support grid. And this support grid here is made of copper. And here's our sample here. But it's really thick at 1.5 microns, right? 1.5 microns is tiny. You can't see 1.5 microns. But in the TEM world, in the nano world, it's really large, actually. And it turns out that it's too large to investigate with an electron microscope. So we have to make this even thinner and smaller here. And we do this by using the ion beam inside of this particular instrument, the fib -SEM. So here's our ion beam. And this is sort of a cutaway. So here's what our sample looks like down here inside of the chamber. Here's our sample. We're sputtering away the material here using our ion beam where we're, while we're simultaneously imaging it with our electron beam. And here's what it looks like after we get it sputtered away. So now if you can sort of imagine this thin coupon now sort of tilted up, if you will. And now we're looking at it in cross section. So here's our gold substrate. Here's our original gold substrate, our gold substrate after we make the coupon, our protective carbon strap or cover here, our protective carbon strap. And here's our tiny, tiny spinel stardust grain sandwiched in between the carbon strap and the gold substrate. And that's what we want to look at inside of our electron microscope, OK? But the problem is, is that you can't actually handle this. You could never pick it up with your, with your hand or your fingers, OK? But you could pick up the support grid on which this thing actually sits. So our sample is actually sitting right there. Can you, can you see it? Can anybody make it out? Not really? OK, so there it is, right? So there it is right there, hanging off in flagpole style, our, our total coupon. So this thing right here is actually this whole thing. And our small stardust grain is sitting in there, but you can't actually see it. Okay. So now, now we've got an actual sample uh, in this, this unimaginably small material that we can take to our electron microscope and look at it now for structure and chemistry. So here's what it actually looks like when you get it inside of the electron microscope. So here's our protective carbon cover. Here's our gold pedestal. And here's our small stardust grain of MgAl204 sitting in between here. And we can probe this for grain size. We can pro pro probe it for chemistry and chemical makeup, which is what this image tells us here. We can interrogate its atomic structure. We can ask, is this grain crystalline? Yes, it's crystalline by looking at its diffraction patterns. If it's crystalline, does it conform to a specific atomic structure? Okay, And if it conforms to a specific atomic structure, does that tell us something about pressure and temperature? 
We can measure it for its chemistry. So that's what this is showing you here. This is actually an X-ray spectrum that we acquire from the grain. And you can see there are a bunch of peaks here, carbon, oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, some other elements like platinum, gold, chromium. Many of these elements are in here because they were produced during the sample preparation process. And so the important ones really are oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, chromium, and iron. And by looking at this spectrum, we can actually quantify it. We can say something about the mineral chemistry. What are the proportions of these atoms relative to one another for different parts of the sample? Because we have atomic resolution, we can probe these things at very, very small spatial scales. So this is a 50 nanometer scale bar here. So we've measured the chemistry of the grain in two different areas. So this particular uh, chemistry conforms to this area measured here, and this one in red conforms to this area here. And then what we can do is use that information to place it into some sort of context in, ter in terms of thermodynamics. We can ask, okay, we know what the chemistry is. We know what the structure is. What do we know that tells us? What does that tell us basically about pressure and temperature? So we can go to theoretical calculations, which uh, aim to basically model the kinds of minerals that form in these kinds of environments uh, as temperature and pressure varies. So this is a table of, a, of a, a number of different types of minerals that form at different temperatures. So all these numbers in here are different temperatures. And along the top row here are different pressures. And so by comparing the chemistry and the structure of these grains uh, to what we know we can form in the laboratory or through doing these calculations, we can say that some of these grains formed at specific temperatures and specific pressures, okay? And so you might say, well, so what? Why is that important now, okay? We've placed constraints on temperature and pressure conditions, and the reason it's important is because by knowing under what conditions some of these grains formed, we might be able to say something about where they formed around the star, okay? The radial distance away from the center of the star at, uh, at which these grains actually condensed, okay? And so we did that in, in some of these cases. And this is sort of a cartoon of one of the kinds of stars that we think some of these grains formed around. This is a sort of cartoon of an asymptotic giant branch or AGB star. And you can see it's divided up into different regimes. Uh, there's the, set, the photosphere of the star. This is sort of the outer surface here. Then there's the gaseous envelope itself. There's the outer uh, CSE or circumstellar envelope the inner circumstellar envelope, and then somewhere in between is the intermediate circumstellar envelope. And this is divided up into different distances, typically expressed in terms of stellar radii, so that is the radial distance away from the star. So out here in the outer circumstellar envelope, we're about, what, 20,000? I think that's 20,000 stellar radii, and temperatures are really low here, 10 Kelvin. 100 stellar radii for the intermediate regime, and 100 Kelvin. And then the inner circumstellar envelope here, which is about 1,000 to 2,000 Kelvin, somewhere between one and five stellar radii, okay? So by using the grain chemistry, we've been able to basically say that if the models hold up, then the grains, some of the grains, these oxide grains that we're looking at based on their chemistry and their structure probably formed right in here at around 1,500 or so Kelvin, which forms right inside of this inner circumstellar envelope, okay? So by, in other words, by looking at these, these stardust grains, we're basically providing astronomers with ground truth. We have samples of these stars that we can get into the laboratory. We can measure them for their chemical and structural makeup. Uh, and we might be able to provide astronomers with testable predictions. That is, if we can say where these things are forming, maybe astronomers can point their telescopes to stars and start looking in specific locations for the kinds of grains that have been preserved in these primitive meteorites, okay? So why don't I just wrap up in the next couple minutes here by saying that if a whole is a sum of its parts, then by looking at the constituent minerals uh, within these primitive meteorites here, looking at them at really, really small levels of scale, we can learn about the kinds of chemistry and physics that occurred at these enormous levels of scale uh, before our solar system formed over 4.6 billion years ago. But we need sophisticated laboratory techniques to do it, okay?
So I'm going to thank you and leave it there. If we have any questions, we have time for a few questions. We also have a mic up here. Questions? Quick question. Uh, how long did it fully take you to understand um, the transmission electron microscope? <laughs> I feel like it's pretty complex. Yeah, uh, well, it took many years, actually. So, uh, you know, one, one starts out, uh, are you a college student? Yeah, so you start out in college, right? You're going through uh, your courses and you're learning fundamentals. And, uh, you know, if you have a keen interest in a particular area, um, you end up going to graduate school and you spend uh, many, many hours and years uh, learning how to use these really sophisticated tools. and. Uh, um, you know, it's, I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, you become an expert at some point uh, after many years of study, but you're always learning uh, new things and new techniques and instruments evolve over time as we uh, get a better understanding of the physics and the optics inside of these systems. Uh, but, you know, if I were to actually put, you know, a number of years on it, I'd say probably somewhere around four to five years to actually learn how to use this instrument. Uh, really well to really make this thing sing and be able to get the kinds of data data sets out of it that I've, I've shown you uh, tonight. But that shouldn't discourage you if you're really interested in, <laughs> in science and uh, you really want to learn about these kinds of techniques and you want to do uh, this kind of research. Don't let the, the amount of time it takes uh, to learn these kinds of things discourage you because uh, you know hard work pays off and if it was easy doing everybody would do it, right? Other questions? Up, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really good question, actually. So for that, I'd have to go back even further and give you sort of a history of pre-solar grains. But basically, um, the idea of the possibility of interstellar matter being present in our solar system goes back to really the beginning of the uh, 20th century when isotopes were really starting to be discovered. Okay. And uh, people thought, well, maybe the isotopic composition of Earth and the solar system isn't the same. Maybe there are actually differences that uh, we need to start looking at. And so they started probing meteorites for their isotopic uh, makeup because they were looking for these differences. And so there were these ideas that uh, because of the way meteorites orbit in the solar system, they come from asteroids basically, um, the way these uh, asteroids orbit in the solar system and the way that they're formed, maybe they contain uh, interstellar matter. So the search for pre-solar stardust grains was many decades in the making, and it was a long struggle. Um, there are all kinds of funny analogies uh, as, to, as to the way to describe uh, the search for pre-solar grains, but uh, the one way I, I've, I've heard it described is prolonged groping in the dark. Um, for many years, people were looking and they couldn't find the stardust grains, but they thought that they probably were there. And it really wasn't until um, a group in Chicago in the late 70s basically threw their hands up and they said, let's just really destroy the sample. Let's subject it to these really harsh acids and see what's left, okay? And then they measured this residue and what was left was isotopic anomalies, that is large deviations from anything we know in the solar system. And that's really the key, that we can't explain some of these large deviations from the chemistry of the solar system unless we start talking about nucleosynthetic processes in the stars, okay? And when they found these large anomalies in these residues, they then started looking at them in more detail to see what minerals might be there. And that's when they found diamond. That was the first pre-solar grain to be found. But it really dates back to when isotopes were first uh, discovered in the turn of the, uh, of the 20th century. So you might say nearly 100 years it took for us to actually find these stardust grains in, in meteorites. <laughs>
more questions? Right. Um, at what point of scale does the gold foil used in that um, procedure become not solid per se, like just an atom thick and ready to break or something like that? Oh, the, the gold, oh, okay, so the gold substrate, I think what you're asking me is at what point does it actually fail when we're doing the measurement? Do we actually penetrate through it and maybe we're now at one layer of atoms thick for the material? And the answer is basically never. So what happens is we buy these, these they're very pure gold foils and we, we clean them before we make measurements, but we buy them commercially um, and they're, they're so thick that they're thicker than uh, anything we could ever penetrate with the, with the beam inside of the instrument. So we really never get through them completely so that we lose the sample, which I think may be what you're, what you're getting at, if I'm not mistaken. Does that, does that sound about right or no? It was more to the extent at what level of scale is it that you have just one atom thick? Is that even possible to register? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can make material scientists grow all the time in the lab. Uh, materials that are one layer of atoms thick. We call that a monolayer. So for example, I showed you a picture of graphite um, earlier in the talk. Let's see if I can go back to it. Yeah, so right here, right? Graphite, it turns out, is made of graphene. Graphene is a sheet of carbon atoms, one layer thick, okay? So you can make materials that are one layer thick, but in terms of the gold foil that we use to actually do the measurements, we never get it down to a point where it's one layer of atoms thick. We and, just don't take it that far. And on that diffraction pattern that you went by, isn't the diffraction pattern actually atomic scale? Right, right before that, where you had a scale bar on it? Yeah. yeah, this one here. So right here, we're probably looking at several sheets of atoms in, thick, uh, in thickness. We're just projecting through them to form an image like this. But we can get the sample. Uh, thin enough to a point where it's a few few layers of atoms thick for this kind of measurement, but for the gold foil, which is what we use for doing the isotopic measurements, we never get it that, that thin. We're not interested in looking at the gold because the gold is not the pre solar grain. Any other questions? I have one. We have one in the back. Dennis? Is there any correlation between uh, between differences in the in the materials that are found in the pre-solar grains with the age of the sample, and by that I mean something say found on the moon or something like that, where it hasn't been going undergoing Earth's geological processes to to uh, you know uh, reassimilate it in, into it, and it could have been there for literally millions of years undisturbed. Okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there a relationship between the age of the material, the pre solar grain, and processes that could have affected it, like on the moon? Is that what you're asking? Uh, no. Um, what I'm asking is if there is, if, if, if samples that we believe are older, are we seeing any difference in their composition as opposed to samples that we believe are from newer stars? And I realize we're talking over tens of millions of years and hundreds of millions of years, but, but are there any differences that ah, have been seen? Okay, so the answer to that is in part yes. Um, so pre-solar grain research is actually a rel relatively young uh, field. The first pre-solar grains were um, discovered in the late 70s, early 80s, and our database has been growing over time, and as it's grown, we've learned new things about stars, but it turns out that different stars, depending on uh, their age, uh, have different metallicities. They have different bulk compositions. And the reason for that is that the chemistry of the galaxy actually changes over time. It's something called galactic chemical evolution. So as different generations of stars are born and die, and they shed their matter into the interstellar medium, the ashes of one star become the starting material for another star. And stars are element factories. And so what they do is they take those ashes and they fuse them together to make heavier and heavier nuclei. And as they're ha making heavier and heavier nuclei and they're shedding matter and they're forming these dust grains, these are the things that we're actually measuring, right? So we can look at some of these grains and we can recognize that they come from stars that have different metallicities, that have heavier or lighter isotopic compositions. Now, whether or not those actually correlate with an age of the grain that's very difficult to say. So on Earth, 
and even in meteorites, we can age date samples, right? We can look at their, we can look at other isotopes uh, that decay radioactively, right? They just spontaneously decay and they give off material and we know at what rate that decay happens. Uh, and so we can use that as a way to age date the samples. With pre-solar grains, that's really problematic, okay? And the reason, because, the reason it's problematic is because, uh, for in part, the reasons that you, you sort of alluded to is that they, they're, sur they, they're surrounded by other material in the meteorite and they easily get contaminated, okay? And when they get contaminated, it's very difficult for us to make any sort of clean measurement on them and say, okay, well, grain A formed 100 billion years ago and grain B formed 50 billion years ago or something like that. So it's difficult to correlate in that sense an age of a grain with the chemistry of the star that it came from. But there are other ways that we sort of can probe the chemical makeup of the stars and possibly say something about the relative differences in, in age for, of these different grains. Does that sort of answer the question? Okay, and uh, we are sort of out of time. That we have a clock back here that has died. So, oh, I was wondering, <laughs> is it still? <laughs> clock time stood still, yeah. But anyway, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> and thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month.